The first bill on the agenda is House File 2073. This is the uh, governor's bill. We're going to have the Office of Higher Ed run us through the uh, language. We're down one staffer due to COVID, so we may not have the detail on the numbers today as we would have, but uh, Commissioner Olson, well, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and members we're working off of House File 2073. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Dennis Olson, proud to serve as the Commissioner of the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. And uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, I understand that we're not going to get a uh, spreadsheet walkthrough, uh, but I will do my best to uh, note the budget numbers uh, for, uh, for you and members as well. Uh, but if I fumble anything, uh, please, please note that and be happy to to correct. And uh, Commissioner Olson, this is the updated, uh, revised uh, governor's request, so the numbers are a little different than from what we've seen in the past? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, yes, that's correct. I believe uh, there's an amendment if you want me to speak to the amendment first. All right, let's, let's go to the amendment uh, A23-0066. So, Mr. Chair and members, uh, to the amendment, uh, the the primary uh, goal of the amendment is to reflect uh, the governor's recommendation in the revised budget for an additional $100 million, and uh, the the primary uh, focus of the the $100 million addition is to uh, Minnesota State. $21 million uh, within the amendment uh, will be dedicated to expanded student support services. The governor's original uh, recommendation had $5 million, and so that rounds out the entire uh, system ask for expanded student support services uh, for $26 million. And just as a reminder, that was a recommendation for, uh, for additional mental health uh, professionals, additional social workers, uh, additional student support services uh, on campus. Uh, the amendment also reflects the uh, governor's recommendation for an additional $10 million for Minnesota State, uh, specifically for the workforce training equipment and learning environments. Uh, and as a reminder, that was the uh, system recommendation for uh, teaching and learning labs and uh, related equipment necessary for that, uh, uh, for that additional expansion. Uh, the, the amendment also reflects uh, the governor's recommendation for uh, transfer scholarships within the workforce development scholarship uh, portion and as a reminder that was a recommendation from the system to move uh, the workforce development scholarships to an additional uh, $1,000 so 2500 up to $3,500 for transfer to a Minnesota State University uh, so that's a $12 million recommendation and then a small adjustment in the individual retirement account plan IRAP that's $521,000 and that increases the employer contribution for the IRAP uh, matching the TRA employer contribution. So that rounds out Minnesota State within the amendment. For the University of Minnesota, uh, the governor's recommending moving $10 million um, into the current biennium for uh, the safety and security recommendation. The governor had originally had it in the 26-27 biennium. Uh, that remains but uh, $10 million now for the upcoming biennium reflecting the, uh, the current need. And then an additional $42 million for the University of Minnesota's uh, core mission support recommendation um, and $57 million uh, in the following biennium there. Uh, the only other item outside of the two uh, public systems in the governor's recommendation in the amendment is uh, for the Office of Higher Education for dual training grants uh, in the amount of $4,264,000. And that's to add uh, transportation and child care as eligible industry areas within the dual training grants. So that rounds out the, uh, the governor's $100 million additional uh, recommendation in the amendment, Mr. Chair. Members, I'm gonna move the amendment, so discussion to the amendment. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the employer contributions, um, I see it's going up to 8.75. Is there an employee match required? I, I don't understand how this system works. I'm new to the committee. So if you could just explain to me um, how that will work. Commissioner Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Robbins. Um, that is my understanding as well, is that there is a current differential between uh, the, the IRAP and the, uh, the TRA, the two plans that faculty can uh, participate in. 
and that currently there's a disincentive uh, to participate in one in the in the IRAP over the TRA uh, based on that differential. My understanding is there is is there is a um, uh, an employee contribution, but not not specifically sure what that is. And we do have, I believe, faculty representatives here who could maybe help answer that question here from Minnesota State. Representative Robbins, do you want someone? To... Yes, thank you. All right, I think we have one faculty rep. Welcome to the committee, and please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Chair. My name is Mark Grant. I, um, I'm a communication studies instructor at Dakota County Technical College, and I currently help direct the governmental relations work on behalf of Minnesota State College faculty. <clears throat> Our faculty have a choice when they enter um, our campuses uh, between TRA and IRAP. Um, 2019, the IRS, <clears throat> the percentages between IRAP and TRA are different. In 2018, the IRS determined that we were out of compliance because the employee contribution to IRAP was different than the employee contribution to TRA. So. That was corrected um, through the legislature, and now the percentage uh, contributed by employee to TRA and IRAP match. The employer contribution stayed the same. The employee contribution are in uh, the employee contribution to IRAP and, and TRA are now indexed, and we are looking to have the employer contribution between IRAP and TRA indexed as well. Mr. Chair. Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what is the employee contribution to each and will this amendment also index then the employer contribution? Mr. Grant. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator, I, the, the employee, pardon me, the employee contribution to TRA, I believe is 7.75. You'll forgive me, I am not a TRA participant. Uh, the employee contribution to um, to IRAP is four and a half percent. I'm, pardon me, I'm, I'm, I'm my employee and my employer. So the employer contribution in both is indexed now. The employee contribution, the employer contribution to IRAP is six percent. The employer contribution to TRA, I believe, is currently at seven point seven five, possibly set to increase uh, this summer. I don't know that for sure. This bill, I believe, will index the employer side as well. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, sorry, the employee <laughs> contribution in TRA and IRAP is what? The em Thank you, uh, Chair. Sorry, Representative. The employee contribution to IRAP and TRA is currently both at 7.75. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if you could just show me where in the language it shows it's going to be indexed going forward, I don't see that. Uh, Commissioner Olson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, pulling the amendment here. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Robbins, the language currently in the amendment does not reflect uh, an, an equal index. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I would just like clarification on that, um, you know, via email. I, I want to make sure if we're really understanding what we're doing here. Representative Robbins will do that. That's why we're bringing this uh, forward today so we can understand. And uh, when we start to put the bill together, we'll have that for you. Thank you. Further questions to the amendment? Seeing no further questions, all those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? No. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. To the bill, Commissioner Olson, as amended. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, once again, I'm going to briefly walk through the new appropriations located in Article 1 of the bill, uh, specifically the budget proposals that uh, pertain to the Office of Higher Education. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to go uh, deeper early on in committee 
uh, with the entire budget overview. So I'm just going to hit the highlights again here for the committee since we do have now language in front of us. Uh, we also have staff here from the Office of Higher Education if uh, any specific questions related to uh, language in Article 2 uh, should arise. So, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, first line uh, of the bill, line 2.5 is uh, the recommendation by the governor for state grants. And uh, the current uh, recommendation is $25 million each fiscal year uh, for a biennial total of $50 million, uh, bringing the, the, the new total in the base to $470.074 million. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, this appropriation includes the governor's proposal to respond to the Federal FAFSA Simplification Act. Uh, conforming with changes to the federal needs analysis as well as uh, Pell Grant calculation that's scheduled to be implemented uh, the 24-25 aid year. And uh, as a reminder, this appropriation also includes the governor's proposal to directly benefit students by increasing the living and miscellaneous expense stipend uh, to cover 120% of federal poverty level in the first biennium and increasing to 130% of federal poverty the following biennium. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, the next uh, item is on line 3.6 of the bill, uh, tribal college grants. And this appropriation supports a recommendation to support uh, Minnesota tribal colleges through the existing tribal college supplemental grant assistance program. Uh, this changes the funding formula to include funding for all students that attend tribal colleges uh, in addition to uh, current non-beneficiary students that receive state funding. And uh, Mr. Chair, this uh, recommendation is $3.7 million over the biennium. The current base in the program is uh, $300,000. Next item in the bill, uh, Mr. Chair and members, line 3.12. This is the Intervention for College Attendance Program grants. This appropriation is a one-time proposal to provide continued support to projects that receive federal funds or did receive federal funds uh, for the agency's ICAP program that were intended to mitigate learning loss due to decreased school time and engagement for low-income students and students of color that were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members, uh, the next item is on line 4.20 of the bill. It's a statewide longitudinal education data system, uh, better known as SLEDS. This appropriation supports the governor's recommendation to invest in moder modernizing the IT behind these databases, supporting the development of local training, outreach, and research support, as well as training materials, and also to include external data from the National Student Clearinghouse into the databases. Uh, the current uh, recommendation by the governor is $1.536 million over the biennium, and the current base uh, for the SLEDS uh, program is $3.564 million. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, the next item in the bill is on line 6.31. It's the emergency assistance for post-secondary students. This appropriation supports the proposal to invest in the state's emergency assistance program to increase the number of students receiving emergency grants by increasing the max maximum amount an institution can apply for and also the maximum student uh, grant amount that a student can request. And the current... Uh, the recommendation by the governor is an additional 4.362 million in the program. The current base is 638,000. Uh, Mr. Chair, next item, uh, lines 7.22 through lines 8.11. These appropriations uh, support the recommended increases to the teacher recruitment, teacher retention, and teacher shortage proposals. Uh, these proposed increases are for uh, all three of the existing programs. Uh, for a little bit of context here, for the teacher shortage loan repayment program, uh, the governor's recommending $1.6 million. The current base in that program is $400,000. For the underrepresented student teacher grants, the governor's recommending $1.6 million over the biennium. The current base in that program is $2.25 million. And I'm looking for the other one, my apologies. Uh, for the grants to student teachers in shortage areas program, the governor is recommending $6 million, and the current base in that program is $1 million. Uh, Mr. Chair, the next item is on line 9.1 of the bill. It's the loan repayment assistance program. This appropriation supports the recommendation to support the work of attorneys 
that provide legal representation and advice to low income clients by providing additional loan repayment options for program participants. Uh, this uh, recommendation includes the addition of uh, private loans for repayment within the program. Uh, Mr. Chair, the next uh, item in the bill is on line 10.11. It's the Student Parent Support Initiative. And this appropriation supports the creation of the Student Support uh, Student Parent Support Initiative, which is a competitive grant program for higher education institutions and participating partnering organizations to assist parents of young children and expectant parents by offering services that support their academic goals as well as their health and well-being. Uh, the language uh, is discussed in Article 2 and we have an additional testifier here, Ms. Cullimore, who will be giving a, just a brief overview of the program's intent and impact of following my testimony, Mr. Chair. The next item in the bill is on line 10.18. It's the Minnesota P20 Partnership Executive Director. This appropriation supports a proposal to create an executive director position to advance the work of the Minnesota P20 Partnership and carry out the statutorily mandated requirements of the P20 Partnership. The P20 Partnership was established by the legislature in 2009 and is an interagency initiative co-led by state agencies as well as the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is a new uh, recommendation by the governor, a total of $277,000 uh, over the next biennium. The next uh, item in the bill is on line 10.19. It's the Director of Tribal Relations and Public Engagement. And this appropriation will allow uh, the Office of Higher Education to hire an agency tribal liaison to fulfill the statutory mandate to engage in meaningful tribal consultation with tribal nations through the coordination and assistance uh, of the newly hired liaison. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, this is also a uh, new budget recommendation of $277,000 uh, over the biennium. The next item is on line 10.21. It's the direct admissions program. This appropriation will continue the work of the direct admissions program and provides funding for implementation to bring new participating high schools as well as higher education institutions into year two of the program. For the direct admissions program, uh, the current uh, recommendation by the governor is $850,000 and the current base for the program is $150,000. The next item in the bill, uh, Mr. Chair and members, is on line 10.24. It's the establishment of the American Indian Scholars Program. And this appropriation supports the governor's recommendation to establish the American Indian Scholars Program, which provides a first dollar tuition and fee-free pathway to eligible Minnesota residents who are enrolled members or citizens of federally recognized tribal nations and all members of Minnesota tribal nations, regardless of residency. Uh, the language establishing the program is uh, in Article 2 as well. Uh, the governor's recommendation for the program is $17 million over the biennium. The next item in the bill is on line 11.3. It's the Next Generation Nursing Assistant Initiative. This appropriation supports the proposal to continue the initiative that has previously been supported by Federal American Rescue Plan funds. And as a reminder, this uh, proposes ongoing state funding to continue to support students with all necessary training costs, as well as the cost of books and all related expenses, including the certification exam. Uh, the governor is recommending $3 million uh, in new funding for the, uh, for the program. Mr. Chair, the next item is on line 11.16. It's the Child Development Associate Pathway. And this appropriation is one time and supports the development of a transparent pathway for current child development associate credential holders to be awarded academic credit that aligns with an eligible certificate, diploma, uh, as well as degree programs at Minnesota State. Uh, Mr. Chair, this, uh, this recommendation is one time uh, of $475,000. Uh, Commissioner Olson, Representative Hicks has a question. I'm so sorry, Commissioner Olson, maybe you said this and I just missed it. The Next Generation Nursing Initiative, ongoing or one time? Commissioner Olson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Hicks, ongoing, 1.5 uh, million a year. 
All right, Mr. Chair and members, uh, one more to round it out here. It's on a line uh, 11.29, agency administration. This appropriation supports the governor's recommendation to maintain current staffing at the Office of Higher Education, as well as improve services to uh, students and institutions primarily through uh, necessary uh, IT upgrades within the agency. And uh, Mr. Chair and members, that concludes the uh, appropriation section of the bill. And like I mentioned, we do have uh, staff here to answer any questions uh, on language in Article 2 if necessary. Representative Hicks has a question. Thank you so much. Um, question about the agency administration. So as we were going through things, there's lots of new initiatives, there's lots of new programming, and then I heard you say maintain staffing. So I want to make sure I'm understanding. All of these new programs, all of these new initiatives, no additional staff to support those? Commissioner Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Hicks, uh, new staff necessary for programs. However, all of those uh, related staff costs are included in the uh, the budget recommendation for the new programs through uh, administrative costs that are associated with the programs. Thank you. Representative Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess maintain staffing means different things to different people. So I just want to get this straight. We're way down in enrollment, but yet we're going to keep the same staff. Just, just the thought. Commissioner Olson, I don't know if you need to respond. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. And, uh, Representative Davids, um, yeah, th this is staff specifically uh, recommended for the uh, the Office of Higher Education, uh, not related to any of the, the state colleges, universities, and universities in the Minnesota system. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And enrollment down, staffing being maintained. That That doesn't work. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Representative Davids, it's not just maintained, they're adding 16 and a half FTEs in this bill. So we're increasing. And um, my question to the testifier is, do we know what just those new FTEs, what the cost of just those new FTEs will be? Commissioner Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Scott, I don't have that off the top of my head. I'd be happy to provide that in a, a separate spreadsheet once we pull it out of the administrative costs. All staff recommended for programs have different uh, salary levels associated depending on the, the duties assigned. Uh, thank you, I look forward to that. Okay. <laughs> Representative Cleburne, you look like you want to ask a question, so well, I don't, away. I don't really want to ask a question, it's just kind of a clarification, right? When we're talking about the ongoing funding for the Office of Higher Education, those numbers address the current employees benefits, pay, pay increases, inflation, uh, costs for running the operation. And programs don't get cheaper because they have one person or 5,000 people, right? You still have to administer the program to the standard that we have set as the Higher Education Committee and Legislature, is that correct? Mr. Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Cleborn, that is correct. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, we do have significant uh, inflationary costs related to the uh, the negotiated contracts with current staff. Uh, that's a significant portion of the uh, the ongoing um, uh, costs associated with current staff. Um, I do want to note um, I did uh, misspeak, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, particularly to or in response to Representative David's question uh, within the administrative. Um, recommendation there are two new additional staff um, desperately needed in in critical areas within the office of higher education one is within the audit division we have a significant uh, responsibility uh, in addition to uh, the u.s department of education's compliance and the the compliance required of all of our um, all of our accrediting bodies, uh, we serve an audit function tool, uh, kind of one leg of the three-legged regulatory stool. And so there is uh, an additional audit position in there right now. We, uh, we fulfill that regulatory function with uh, two, two auditors currently in the, in the office. Um, and we're also proposing to add a, uh, an accounting officer as well, uh, making sure that uh, you know, our commitment to, uh, to our, our external partners, particularly um, to uh, to students in, in financial aid and all of the the related um, uh, the related 
duties associated with, uh, with with accounting within the agency are are fulfilled. Representative David. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just thinking uh, fewer students are utilizing these programs. Yes, we have to have the programs, top-notch programs, but there's fewer students there, so the cost, in my mind, should be less. But I think I'll just leave that, Mr. Chair, for now, because we will figure a lot of this stuff out once we get targets. Commissioner Olds, and Representative Hicks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for um, this conversation. I just wanna be 100% clear. We expect our state agencies to do really hard work and to provide oversight. And when they don't, we, this body, have really big reactions and feelings to that. But then when they come to us and say, we need staff to do those things, we say, well, why do you need staff? So I just, as someone who has been asked by this body to do things that are outside of something that I could do as a single human, but being required to do so, I know that my colleagues at state agencies, including the Office of Higher Ed, are doing the absolute best they can with the resources that they have and that they are always accountable to this body and to the citizens of Minnesota. And so I just wanna like say thank you for all of that work and make sure that you know how, how incredibly important I view that work and how incredibly important I view your team. So I just wanted to say that. Commissioner Olson. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Hicks, uh, thank you. I appreciate that as well. Uh, Commissioner, you have one more testifier that you wish to bring up now. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, Ms. Miriam Cullimore uh, to discuss briefly the, uh, the intent and impact of the proposal related to the student parent initiative. Welcome to the committee and uh, please identify yourself for the record. Good morning and thank you Chair Pulowski and committee members. Um, my name is Miriam Cullimore and I serve as the student parent and whole family coordinator with the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The governor's budget proposal seeks $13 million over the biennium to fund the student parent support initiative to be administered by OHI in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Health. This initiative would provide grants to institutions of higher education to fund wraparound services for student parents, such as individualized case management, increased access to childcare, well child visits, emergency grants, among other services. If funded, this initiative creates a win-win-win scenario for our state. <clears throat> student parents and their families win by gaining access to supportive services as they work toward graduation. And the need for support is evident. National research finds that while single mothers who earn college degrees experience significant benefits for themselves and their families, they are also some of the least likely to complete their degree. Only 8% of single mother undergraduates complete an associate or bachelor's degree within six years of their initial enrollment, compared to nearly half of non-parenting women in college. Here in Minnesota, we know student parents are likely to be women, unmarried, enrolled part-time, and low income. About half of student parents who applied for a state grant identified as BIPOC. And aside from private for-profit college enrollment, student parents who applied for a state grant were more likely to enroll at a Minn State college or university. Financial resources in student parent households are tight. In the 2019-2020 academic year, over 50, or excuse me, <clears throat> over 50 percent of unmarried student parents who received a Minnesota state grant had annual incomes under $20,000. And according to recent findings by the Education Trust, Minnesota student parents earning minimum wage need to work about 50 hours per week in order to cover public tuition and child care costs. Student parents were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic as well. According to FAFSA data, Minnesota saw double-digit drops in the enrollment rate of student parents during the pandemic years. We have some recovery work to do, and this initiative can reduce barriers, helping bring parenting students back to school. Institutions of higher education can also win with this initiative. Student parents are highly motivated to succeed. They typically have higher GPAs than their non-parenting peers and are eager to join the workforce in order to support their families. Providing services for parenting students can help schools improve retention rates and attract these high-performing scholars. 
In our state, there are about 39,000 single parents over 25 who have some college credit but no degree, and an additional 30,000 single parents over 25 who've completed high school or a GED but have not pursued higher education. With college enrollment in decline, we need to find ways to engage these potential students and help them see college as a viable option. This initiative can help parents more confidently enroll. With this initiative, the state of Minnesota also wins. By supporting student parents, we invest in greater economic stability for the entire state. Single parents in our state who earn an associate's degree or higher are less likely to live in poverty and utilize fewer public assistance dollars over their lifetime. For instance, single mothers in Minnesota who graduate with an associate's degree are 48% less likely to live in poverty than with a high school graduation alone, saving Minnesota more than $21,000 in public assistance spending over their lifetime. They will earn an additional $295,000 than with a high school diploma, contributing more than $82,000 more per graduate in lifetime state taxes. Likewise, single mothers in Minnesota who graduate with a bachelor's degree are 75% less likely to live in poverty, <clears throat> saving Minnesota more than $36,000 in public assistance spending over their lifetime. They will earn an additional $571,000 over their lifetime than with a high school diploma alone, contributing more than $217,000 more per graduate in lifetime state taxes. State investment in services like those proposed here more than pay off based on what parenting graduates can contribute in future lifetime state taxes. The Institute for, policy, or for Women's Policy Research estimates significant returns on state investments, resulting in $2.95 return for every dollar spent on childcare, $5.13 return for every dollar spent on case management, and $4.70 return for every dollar spent on financial aid. By these estimates, funding these services are worthy investments. The proposed initiative can mitigate the unique challenges experienced by student parents and their families while also benefiting institutions of higher education and the state of Minnesota. There is substantial support here at home, and this initiative has received national attention as well. By funding the student parent support initiative now, we open the door to higher education for more families, become leaders in providing support for student parents, and move closer to Minnesota's post-secondary attainment goal. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Any questions to the testifier? <laughs> Seeing none, oh, wait, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chair. Thank you for the testimony and the numbers about the number of um, students out there who have some credit but not, um, you know, have have not finished their degree was really interesting. I appreciate that, those numbers. So, you know, I'm interested, to me it, it seems like it would make more sense rather than creating a grant program that goes to professional organizations, community-based organizations, post-secondary institutions, and other applicants, and creating a whole new program and standing that up, it seems like it would be better to give money to these students who are enrolled through the state grant for Child care. So can you explain to me, that seems so much simpler and cleaner. So, so why do we need a whole new grant program and a whole new infrastructure around this? Ms. Cullimar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that this uh, program is designed to do is to allow institutions of higher education to create partnerships in the community as well as um, provide the services that their student body is saying that they need. Um, they, this is meant so that the institutions can tailor these services and provide wraparound support rather than just giving money to the student and hoping that they make the best choices with, the, with those funds or, um, you know, the, this really allows the schools to provide that additional support outside of just the, the money, the financial aspect. Um, often student parents are needing some other type of support in terms of coaching through the college process. Um, really understanding the college landscape. Many of these students are uh, first, uh, first generation students as well, and so they have the additional challenges that come along with not understanding the college landscape and often need some of that coaching to get through. Representative Raman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. I guess that 
honestly raises more questions than answers for me. I mean, um, I, I think, you know, we should trust the students to make the best decisions and, and have less bureaucracy in their way, but that's my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further? Representative Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and overall on this, we're looking for another $100 million. So that means an increase of over $431 million from what I understand. This is just a supplemental. And just for example, the state grant program uh, through OHE in 2015 was um, 95, over $95 million, 2018 over $80 million, and 2022, $69 million. So that's a huge decrease in the grant program, but yet we're putting more people in there to do less. And that's something we're gonna have to look at very closely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Davids, um, not sure on those numbers. You may be looking at, I'm not sure what you're looking at, but that sounds like the number of students participating, uh, not in the millions, but 69,000 sounds like the current number of students participating in the grant, but the appropriation is over $210 million a year okay, for state you, grant. Mr. Chair, I got the numbers off the internet, Thank so you. I just figured they're correct. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right, Mr. Chair, Represent that's students not, money. <laughs> students, not money. Right. Representative McDonald. Mr. Chair, thank you. Question for Mr. Olson. So with the uh, increase of the budget, I think uh, with the numbers we have in front of us is a $430 million increase, is that correct? Commissioner Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative McDonald, that's correct. Uh, so uh, the goal for the Office of Higher Education, I would presume with that big of an increase, would be to get as many kids enrolled in the uh, universities. Would that be a correct statement? Commissioner Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative McDonald, um, absolutely. And we feel as though a lot of the uh, proposals uh, by the governor, in addition to support to uh, both public systems, uh, will help facilitate that, certainly. Representative Scott. Oh, uh, Mr. Chair, oh, I'm sorry. Representative McDonald. I should make more eye contact with the, That's all right. the good chair. Uh, so I just want to follow that up, Mr. Olson, with uh, I hope that uh, I'll hear the answer that you're going to say. Uh, in addition to that increase, which is a large increase, I uh, remember the days when Minnesota had a budget deficit. I was first elected in 2011-12 as a $4 billion deficit. And I was brand new, of course. There was 31 of us new folks and uh, new in health and human services, and I think it was in public safety. And boy, the outcry from the whole state of don't cut my budget, please just leave us harmless uh, without raising taxes, just do what you can. Now with the surplus, of course, I've been here 13 years, we've seen surpluses and deficit, and everybody wants more money, more money, more money. But I remember, and I'll never forget, and I'll use this as I, become a, as I continue to legislate, those days when there was a budget deficit, the great organizations such as the Office of Higher Education and all the other agencies came in and they were so diligent. Oh, we will do more with less. We will work hard. Please don't cut us. And as soon as we get surpluses, boy, they want more, 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 more money. I think the appropriation is a wee bit too much considering the shape we're in in here in Minnesota because we're not guaranteed if we have a $65 billion budget that the governor wants, we're not guaranteed we're going to have that kind of revenue coming in in 24, 25, and 26, 27. Uh, there are tumultuous times in our country and in the world, as you're all aware. So I think the Office of Higher Education and the governor's budget proposal needs to be very careful. And, and I'm sure the good chairman is going to be probably on the side of more fiscal responsibility than in uh, increasing a $430 million budget. But I'll get to my question and then I'll just uh, be still. Uh, of that increase, how much of that funds or work, because uh, Representative Hicks said she knows that the people at the Office of Higher Education do the best work. I don't know how she knows that, but I'm sure she's correct, and I hope that's true, uh, is going to help kids get into the trades and into the technical colleges where they're so desperately needed, and there's so much work, and they can make so much money with so little debt. It's, it's unthinkable. It's wonderful. So what is the Office of Higher Education, and I'll keep still now, uh, doing with this increase to push that agenda as well, because we so desperately need good people to do good hard work in our state. Commissioner Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative McDonald, really appreciate the question um, and you know appreciate you bringing us back to 2011, 2012, uh, during the deficit time where uh, we really started the, uh, the unfortunate pattern of disinvesting in higher education, which brings us to today. 
um, you know, it's the reason why students continue to uh, raise the alarm over you know, tuition increases, over tuition increases, over tuition increases. And, um, you know, as you were referencing that, uh, that period, you know, I looked back and just pulled out uh, Minnesota State's, you know, increase in tuition over those period of years. And I see 3%, the next year 3%, the next year 3.5%. A couple years in 14, 15, when we froze tuition, the legislature made the choice to, to freeze tuition and fully fund it. That's when we took an opportunity to start writing the ship. These last few years, I think we've, you know, we've taken advantage of uh, good budget times and continue to invest in higher education. But as Chancellor Mahaltra and other leaders would say in, in front of the committee, uh, these are these are down payments uh, on the future, and you know we are we are digging out of a a deep disinvestment hole over the last decade plus. Um, you know, and Minnesota has, has fared a little better than some of the other states in the region, but uh, you know, this budget certainly reflects uh, all that, that students need now, but certainly they're going to need continued investment into the future. Uh, Representative uh, McDonald, related to your question uh, around two-year programs and technical programs, um, they're all over the bill. They are absolutely all over the bill. Um, one of the pieces in the uh, the revised the governor's revised budget uh, related to dual training grants, that is all an opportunity to earn while you learn in uh, careers related to advanced manufacturing. The governor proposing to add transportation as an industry, um, you know, plenty of other other industry specific um, needs in there that that are deemed by. Department of Employment and Economic Development as high need, but also high value occupations as well, all primarily related to, to technical programs and the trades. Um, within the, the governor's bill, um, there, are, uh, there are opportunities for, like I had mentioned, the Next Generation Nursing Assistant Initiative. That is a, uh, a pretty quick program that gets someone an opportunity to jumpstart their, their nursing or their healthcare career trajectory, but gets them into work fairly quickly. Again, I wouldn't consider that a, a two-year program. It is a certificate program, certificate level program, but focused on immediate employee um, employment and also an immediate uh, need within, within the state workforce. So, you know, I could, I could certainly go on. We'd be happy to roll up, you know, all of the, the two-year technical or trades programs that are reflected in the budget. Uh, more than happy to provide that to you, but um, short answer, they're, they're all over the budget, in addition to the recommendations to support primarily Minnesota State, which, you know, as you well know, has, has all of our, uh, our two-year and technical program, public programs reflected. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the testifier, Ms. Um, Colomore, is that correct? Um, just wondering, um, in this new program that you um, just told us about, um, is there some duplication there? Because we already have child care grants. Um, it looks like $13.388 million um, forecast for that or set aside for that. So is there some duplication? Ms. Collymore. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for that question as well. Um, I would say that this expands that access to child care um, these would be this would be funds allowed to, uh, that would uh, allow schools to expand perhaps the number of students that they're able to put into child care facilities um, they would allow it would allow them to create partnerships with uh, child care providers in the community um, to set aside spots specifically for student parents um, to enroll their children into an early childhood program um, so it adds to the available funds for student parents. Um, not all schools participate in the uh, child care grant program either, and so this would expand to those schools that are no uh, that are not currently part of that program. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, are the number of parents that would do we have data that show that the number of uh, single parents has expanded commensurately with? Um, what we're doing here with the 13.388 and what's in your new program? Ms. Cunningham. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, could you say that one more time? Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry if it wasn't clear. So between the child care appropriations in the bill that you talked about and the 13.388 million 
that we currently have in child care are have the number of single parents that would use that um, grant has that has the number of the have the number um, of those single parents risen as well what what does that look like year over year a couple of years back um, I, thank you uh, thank you mr. chair um, so we've not necessarily gotten great data on the number of student parents that exist in the state. It's been very difficult to get that data. Um, we rely heavily on our FAFSA data for that. Um, one of the things that I would say is that we spend out our, um, you know, the, the amount that's given out in uh, our state child care grants uh, currently, we, out, we, we spend that out every single year. The demand is there. And oftentimes we're hearing from institutions of higher education that more funds are needed in these areas. This would be establishing a complementary program that goes side by side with the state grant, um, with the state child care grant program that's already in existence. Um, it would also allow students uh, or institutions of higher education to um, potentially start up new um, child care facilities on campus that would be easier to access for student parents um, and kind of get back to where uh, campuses have you know had more options for student parents uh, for their children to be present on campus Representative Scott. Uh, thank you mr. chair and um, th thanks for that explanation I'm wondering if there's gonna have to be a capital investment then on those campuses to build new child care centers I don't, the commissioner, do you need to respond to that? Mr. Chair, Representative Scott, uh, no, it hasn't been expressed to us at this time. Representative Scott, I think the, the majority of campuses have some type of a child care center, um, and we can get a report from that uh, from particularly Minn State, but those centers exist, and they have been rather tenuous as a result of the pandemic, so we're hoping that we can continue to have those child care centers on those campuses. Mr. Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then I had a, um, just some information. Um, you know, Mr. Um, Olson went through um, kind of funding since, um, you know, about a decade ago. And um, I'm just wondering, I, I look at a report here that talks about U.S. birth rates um, drop for the fourth year in a row. Um, we're at a as of 2018, we are at a 32-year low of birth rates. So the fact of the matter is, is that we're on this trend towards, um, because of declining birth rates, we're on a trend of declining enrollment. And so I don't know um, globally if this budget um, kind of addresses that, because the future is lower enrollment because of lower birth rates. And we are increasing, you know, we're spending a heck of a lot of money in this budget with not only the current decline in enrollment, but for the foreseeable future. Um, now, I've encouraged my children to each have four children to help compensate for that because we only had two. But um, I, I think that there has to be, um, we can't just budget for the here and now, we have to budget for the future. And I don't, I don't see that happening here. What I see is a budget that's really spending a lot of money that is going to put us back into deficit in future years. Mr. Olson. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Representative Scott. Uh, yeah, appreciate you highlighting the, uh, you know, the demographic cliff that you know we know is is shortly coming here uh, related to. Uh, fewer high school graduates, uh, potentially fewer uh, students enrolling in college. Um, you know, what's exciting about the options uh, available uh, within the you know, incredible higher education landscape in the state uh, is that, you know, there are options and opportunities for everyone, not just newly graduating high school seniors. Uh, in Minnesota, we have uh, close to, uh, and I'll, I'll find the exact number if it's necessary, but close to 600,000 uh, Minnesotans with some college no degree and many of them are looking for an opportunity while they work uh, to uh, you know either upskill or reskill uh, you know opportunities to to earn an additional certification an additional ad additional degree uh, that will propel them into uh, you know renewed job opportunities or potentially a, a change or shift in careers completely 
uh, you know, we need to remember that, that there are a significant number of, of adult students in Minnesota too that either want to finish their degrees or are looking for, for something else. Um, plenty of options provided by, you know, not only our, our two uh, incredible public systems, but uh, our private college system as well. So, um, yeah, you know, certainly noted the research is showing us that, uh, that we are facing a demographic cliff in addition to, um, you know, an ever increasing aging population, but um, certainly, you know, adult students are, uh, are a population we can, can and should be focusing on as well. Representative Scott, any more? Um, I would just say that there are opportunities out there for those folks now. I don't know what their demographic looks like as far as enrollment, um, if they're included in those more global numbers that we've been seeing. I'm assuming those are full-time students, that, the numbers that we've been seeing. But um, that's my only comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I have two more on my list, and then we're going to have to move to the next bill. So Representative Davids. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do want to correct for the record, my numbers were incorrect. I, I should have been talking students, not dollars, just so that's uh, cleared up. Uh, but if, maybe if uh, a nonpartisan staff could get me some numbers. One is, I'd like to go back to 2010 and see what the administrative costs have been. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to go back to 2010 and see what the total enrollment is. Uh, if maybe if nonpartisan could do that, that shouldn't be too tough to get. It'd be tough for me, but they're a lot smarter. Representative Davids, they're nodding that they can get it for you. Okay, that, that, I'd, I'd just like to see that. And then uh, also, I don't think there'll be any bonding bills for buildings because of the lower enrollment. They should have plenty of space. And Mr. Chairman, I guess I've just never thought about recommending how many kids my kids should have. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. And Representative Hicks, you have one. I was just going to say um, that is like my favorite topic. So um, one, one of the things that I just want to say about that as a large family uh, is that if we want to attract people to Minnesota and encourage folks to have more kids, we need to make that possible for people. We need to make it financially possible to both achieve their goals and expand their family. And so I'm excited about any proposal that does that all the time. So thank you so much. Commissioner Olson, thank you.